hello. Whoa, okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hear yes, good? Okay, good. I can project, I have theater background, so if that helps. Uh, won't help with recording, but you know, whatever. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I want to thank you all for, uh, for being here. Um, this title is, is something that kind of, it seems... Uh, I don't know, it just, it, it, like, it seems like, okay, why the heck is, is, this, is this quote? Uh, I thought I sucked at games, but games sucked for me. There's a reason why I, call, I, I titled this specifically for UX Summit, uh, because this, if anyone was in, uh, anyone here from uh, UX, Games UX Summit from 2017? Anyone was able to attend? Shout, because I can't see hands. <laughs> there we go, okay. <laughs> so um, that's me. Um, and this was a panel that uh, I was uh, I was invited to to be a part of um, as part of this uh, part of the summit. And uh, you might recognize a few folks in there, especially if you knew Alex Nianiki, uh formerly of Naughty Dog, and then we've got Bryce Johnson, Sans Beard uh, from Microsoft. And that was actually the first time I got to I got to meet them. Uh, and so yeah, this was this was Game Summit uh, 2017. And the reason why I have this photo here. Um, I actually will get to in a minute, and it will help also explain my title. But also, what is me? Uh, hi, I'm Steve Saylor. I'm blind, and I play video games. And I have two different bios here because at the time in 2017, I was working in the radio industry. I was working as a digital content producer for one of the largest radio stations in Toronto, and I was a blind YouTuber. I basically was playing a lot of games, and I was kind of, I called it the blind gamer. And it was basically a Let's Play series that I had created where I, to kind of separate myself from people like Markiplier or Jacksepticeye, I thought, well, you know what, I'm blind. Well, that could be my niche. And then it was, because it was more funny to actually watch me fail playing a video game than it was for me doing well. Um, and that, at the time, I was actually kind of excited to be invited to do a talk about me being blind and, and, and accessibility because I'll be 100% honest, before the Game Summit, I didn't even know what accessibility was. I didn't even know that that was even a word. It was not a word that was in my vocabulary at all. Uh, I just thought I was there as just a YouTuber. I was like, oh my god, the, I, they invited a gamer to actually get to talk to game developers. I, was, I kind of felt honored in that sense. But since then, um, my bio's kind of grown a little bit. Um, I kind of credit Games UX Summit is sort of like launching sort of my career in accessibility because I became a, a full-time content creator. I'm a Twitch ambassador and accessibility advocate and consultant in the video game industry. I was able to consult on a few games you might know of, Last of Us Part 1 Remake and Part 2, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Watch Dogs Legion, uh, Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, and I'm currently the accessibility consultant for the Call of Duty franchise. That grew specifically from this talk, or from 2017. Again, I keep teasing that, I will get to that in a minute. But first, let's go a little bit back. This is me. I did not like those glasses or that sweater. Uh, <laughs> those glasses were, they were, were a product of my parents and uh, because they thought, well, I'm very sensitive to, to sunlight. What if, they ha what if Steve just had sunglasses as part of his regular glasses? S but the problem was, this is a bad UX experience because I basically for a year and a half saw my entire life through orange and pink sort of hue. So literally for about two years of my, of my childhood, I would literally look through rose colored glasses. Um, and I remember playing video games as a kid because my, my mom took my brother and I to a local video store called Jumbo Video. And they were selling the original Nintendo Entertainment System. My mom bought it, she says, because it was a gift for my dad for Father's Day. My dad never touched it. Uh, but my mom and my brother and I did. It was actually a period of time where we were playing the original Super Mario and we would pass the controller back and forth. I say playing because I wasn't really doing a lot of the playing my mom and my brother were because anytime I would get the controller, I would die in about 30 seconds and then I have to pass it on and it'll just play for like several minutes at a time. I actually remember waking up in the middle of the night one time and it was like three o'clock in the morning. I went downstairs to get like a drink of water and my mom was playing Super Mario and I was, and she actually beat it before my brother and I did. And I still say to this day, she could have been a gamer but she found the NES version of Monopoly, and that's the only game that she's ever played since. She got lost in that game to the point where you never want to cross my mom Monopoly, just saying. 
She will, even if you win, she will refuse to believe and, or acknowledge that you won. Um, but I used to think I sucked at games because I was like, I, I wasn't really that great at them. I would watch my friends play but it was, and my brother play, but I wasn't really that super great at it. And to kind of explain a little bit, at least if you don't know, haven't seen, I have a YouTube video where I talk about my vision, but I'll kind of very br briefly go over it. So imagine, we're, like, we're taking a look at Fortnite. This is kind of like uh, talking about the visual acuity and also just how normal setups are for gaming. So this is Fortnite. Basically, it's at 1080p at, like, 2020, if you have 2020 vision, sitting at about five to six feet away. This is generally kind of a typical nor normal living room setup. You're sitting on a couch in front of a decent-sized TV. You can generally see pretty much everything that's on screen. But for myself, if I'm sitting on the exact same couch with my glasses on, this is basically what I see. It's a little bit smaller, it's a little bit blurrier, I can kind of see the enemies, I can kind of see my own character, and I can sort of see at least that I have a health bar, or that I have weapons, but I have no idea what weapons I even have, uh, or, sp or specifically. And my visual acuity is basically 2200 with glasses on. If you don't want a, a quick brief on, on visual acuity, if you're someone that's considered perfect vision 2020, to you it would be like, okay, you're looking at someone 20 feet away, it would be 20 feet away. For me, with glasses on, it's 2,200, so someone's 20 feet away, looks like it's 200 feet away. Now, if I was to take my glasses off, that's a whole other uh, scenario whatsoever, it's much blurrier, can barely see anything, and, this, and now my vision's at like 2,700, something like that. So my glasses help, but it still doesn't give me enough visual acuity that I can be able to play games. My actual normal setup right now is I have a 50-inch TV that's sitting on my desk that I sit about a foot and a half away from, and that's how I'm able to see and, and play video games, and including using my computer monitor. Um, and so that, and that was, that's kind of how I was, and even playing video games, essentially, it was uh, like even doing, doing YouTube, it essentially was like that. I was sitting, in a, like that was my normal setup. And it wasn't until, back to this photo again, I came to this, uh, I came to this uh, summit, and I was it, like literally in the middle of this panel, I had an epiphany. I kept telling myself that for years, my entire life, for the entire three years of my life, <laughs> I sucked at games. But it was in this moment that I realized it was that games sucked for me. And it was at that moment that I really dedicated myself to wanting to learn more about accessibility and wanting to be able to help, uh, be able to make this industry more accessible so that kids like me can growing up can be able to play games with their friends. And so we're going to take a look a little bit at the industry and see kind of like what games suck, for, like, or what games suck, what games don't suck, and then we're going to see how we can make games suck less. All right? So first part is games that sucked for me. Took me a little bit to be able to figure out what games suck for me because a lot of times I can just tell when a game is going to suck for me and I just won't even play it. So these are games specifically that I tried to be able to play, that I really wanted to be able to play, but just couldn't. First up, Cyberpunk. Yeah, I figured that's what the reaction I would get for that one. Um, now this one, obviously the UI was very busy, very complex, and I'm saying this all in a very polite way as I possibly can, um, and, it was, and it was definitely difficult, but it was sort of playable, at least for me. But I could tell that there was a lot of things uh, uh, that, were, that could have used improvement for other uh, types of disabilities. And I kind of saw this as sort of like an example of this was a game that wasn't designed with accessibility in mind from the beginning. Now granted, this game was started in 2012, 2013, when accessibility was barely even kind of thought about in the gaming industry. So I understand that it took a while for even accessibility to kind of ramp up to the point where if they even want, if CD Projekt Red wanted to add this in there, accessibility in there, it would have been more of a Band-Aid than anything else. And so it wasn't designed with accessibility in mind. Another example, Returnal. Uh, Sorry, Timmy Negan. Uh, <laughs> I, I bring up this one because it's difficult. And I mentioned only the difficulty aspect of this, and I also didn't specifically didn't put up Elden Ring as another one of uh, this one, because uh, that's, that's, a, that's a trauma response for me right there. Um, but essentially, it was difficulty, like it was difficult in games, and it was harder for me to be able to at least see just out of all the chaos that was happening, including the uh, part of the UI, and I could just tell, like this is when I was like, I could really start to tell like for other disabilities that it just, it sort of worked, but not really, and it was, and even with the, the accessibility that was in the game, kind, again, was kind of more of, of a Band-Aid, and especially with 
the, uh, we'll talk a little bit about sort of the difficulty in games, but I definitely want to at least at this point acknowledge that there is a really, really great, very short talk on YouTube um, from the, uh, you may know this person, Ian Hamilton. He has a really, really yeah, love Ian. Uh, he has a really great talk about difficulty and accessibility. I highly recommend watching that because that'll give you a much better perspective than what I could be able to explain as, as far as difficulty and accessibility. Um, so just do, do that search on, uh, on YouTube. Another one that I wanted to bring up was in regards to more multiplayer games, and that's Valorant. Sorry, writers, I know. Um, I tried to be able to play this one, and this one was, was difficult, and it sort of made me realize why I kind of dislike multiplayer games to a lot of sense. Because sometimes, the, and, and, and I know Rachel talked about yesterday about uh, toxicity or in, in gaming, this was something that I realized, oh yeah, not a lot of people want to play with a disabled player. Because there's many times I would jump into a match and I would start seeing people just disappear, like my teammates would disappear. And I couldn't figure out why. And then I realized, oh shoot, I have blind in my gamer tag. I'm blind gamer Steve. And they would just basically just leave because they just don't want to play with it. They just don't want to play with a disabled player. And then there'll be times that I would get basically, like I'm trying the best I can, but they would make fun of me or basically uh, yell at me because I wasn't doing the thing that they said to do. And I'm trying to just desperately just try to survive, let alone get a kill in. Um, and so multiplayer games are were, were difficult just in general. And I know I say this as I said earlier that I was in the I was working on Call of Duty. So this is something that I, I also call out Warzone in and of itself. So I'll, I'll even pick on my own uh, consultancy work. It's, we're working on it. We're working on it, I swear. Um, all right, so that's part two. So let's talk about games that didn't suck for me. Games that I thought actually were really great. One of them being, obviously, Last of Us Part Two. We all know that game. I helped consult on it, so I definitely know that game very inside and out. But this was like one of those like, uh, series that, of course, broke the door open for uh, just the general gaming public to know more about accessibility. I kind of, uh, there was, I can't remember, there was a quote that was uh, attributed that I, I really love that The Last of Us Part Two wasn't the end of acknowledgement of accessibility, it was the beginning, uh, or is the end of the beginning. And that means that we have a lot more way to, like, a lot more ways to go, and we're always gonna think about Last of Us as sort of like a touchstone point, like what accessibility was before The Last of Us Part Two, and accessibility afterwards. Um, but there is also some learnings that can be made from that uh, as well, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, next up, we learned about this earlier, Forza Horizon 5. This is the first time that a blind person can be able to drive at 200 miles an hour in Mexico and actually do well. Um, it's something that I can't do in real life. Um, and, I thought, and, and I just really, really loved it, and I thought that the accessibility was just extremely well done, and it goes to show, as Tara had mentioned earlier, that when accessibility is a pillar and it's part of the, of the process, you can do some really, really amazing work, and it gives uh, you more opportunities to be able to do even better work even after the game is launched, as we learned. Another one that I want to bring up, you wouldn't think of this as accessible, but it's a game called Dead Cells. Anyone played Dead Cells here? Yeah? If, I don't know if you know this, but just recently, this year, they released a new update called Breaking Barriers. They added a ton of accessibility that basically I think actually rivals The Last of Us Part II in regards to just the, how many options are available. And I bring this slide up because there have been a lot of games post-launch that have been able to improve accessibility to make it even more playable for disabled players, even if it wasn't at the very beginning. So games like Dead Cells, Ghost of Tsushima, Deathloop, and Sea of Thieves, all post-launch have had a tremendous success in adding in more and more accessibility so that more and more disabled players can be able to play it. So, let's think about this one. Okay, what about making games suck less? That is definitely a challenge. And I have a, about a few, few points I think that could, uh, I think could work um, for, for all of you here. Uh, and if you have any questions about it, please feel free to ask. I can definitely expand about it uh, on a little bit. Um, but the first one is, have accessible, make more accessible design, less accessibility options. I'm not the first one to kind of coin this sort of a sentiment uh, in the industry. There's definitely people smarter than I that have, uh, have mentioned this first, but the thing that The Last of Us sort of taught us was that it was great to have a lot of options, and it's great to be able to customize a player's experience. But the problem that we started to see was once we started, like as players started to play it, was that there were a lot of options that players missed because there was just too many options. It's great, but, like, and, uh, but essentially what it breaks down to is that if you can, be, if you can create accessibility as part of the design, sometimes those options may not even be needed. 
but we'll use colorblind as an example. I think it's been mentioned a few times in the past two days, in that basically if you design something without, like, that you have a mechanic that doesn't rely on color, you don't necessarily need colorblind options. If you have a game that doesn't even have dialogue, you don't really need subtitles. Captions, yes. Subtitles, maybe not so. So when you start to kind of think about accessibility as a design point, you start to kind of uh, realize that sometimes options can work if there's something you're trying to design doesn't really, like, uh, like you can't really fix it in the design process, but you can add an option to kind of complement that. Um, but in a lot of times, you can sort of, if you can find that right balance, then you can really truly make a game that's accessible from the ground up. Uh, and I actually kind of want to mention something. I don't know if this is, this is sort of rudimentary or something that, uh, that you may or like, oh yeah, no, this is totally get it. Well, I, I, I kind of had to sort of think about, I keep saying make games accessible by design. And I kind of had to start thinking about, okay, what does that actually mean? And I know that's an that's a, that's a existential crisis that a lot of us in UX kind of think about. Um, but for me, I always sort of think about, it's trying to be able to think about how many players are going to want to be able to play this game. And I use it, like, say you come up with a really cool mechanic in a game. And, like, you're in the design process, you love it, but you need to be able to hit a specific button at a specific time with a controller. And that's great. But when you start thinking about accessibility from design, you have to start thinking about, okay, does it have to be a specific button? Can it be any button? Can it be a toggle? Can it be a switch? Can it be a thumbstick? Can it be a touchpad? There like, or there's other things you can be able to kind of think about. It's like, okay, does it have to have that button? Also, with the, with the timing of it, precise, does it have to be at a precise time? Can, uh, like, can you turn that timing off and would still have the same effect as far as that mechanic to make it fun and exciting? Or can you be like, you know what, let's just add an option and be like, okay, you can adjust the timing of that mechanic to make it a little bit more easier and comfortable to build play. And then you think about, okay, the controller side. Do you have to have a controller to play? What if you can't hold the controller? What if you can only use a mouse and keyboard or an adaptive controller? Or you can only hold the controller with one hand? When you start thinking about all those aspects, you start inviting more and more potential players to be able to enjoy that same mechanic than just saying you have to hit a button at a specific time with a controller. That's what I generally mean when I, when I think about more accessible design. Another point is dying over and over again is not a good experience for disabled players. We see that a lot now. Um, I mean, I just have to mention Souls uh, games, Souls-like games, to any dis disability advocate, and they just shudder um, because we all understand this aspect. And the reason why I say, like, I understand when a dying mechanic actually is implemented well, and I, and I, I sort of uh, think of like Deathloop as a as a great example, um, and technically, I would even say Returnal because it's part of the story. But when you're trying to be able to get past a certain point, and you're trying to be able to just like uh, uh, you're trying to be able to uh, get past a boss or a particular enemy, and if you're trying, and the only way to learn how to get past that enemy is to die over and over again, so that you know what not to do, that can be a problem for disabled players, mainly because they have no idea whether it's the game that's the problem or it's their disability getting in the way. And if you don't have something that's accessible from the beginning, or at least offer the ability to be able to adjust that experience to kind of eliminate some of the barriers, then they can start to see the, how, how, like they can use the dying mechanic as a way to be like, oh, I can see this the visual um, I, that I couldn't be able to do before because I, it was always a, an audible sort of uh, visual, like audible sort of cue. Okay, and now I know, okay, if I, if I wait for this particular moment, I can be able to hit this enemy or dodge at a specific time. When you add that, when you add those kind of accessibility as part of the process, then you start to kind of like, then you break away down those barriers, and then that player doesn't really feel like that their disability is getting in the way. Another one is disabled players want to play multiplayer too. I know I call it Warzone, it's fine. It, 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 I'll get in trouble for it later. It's whatever. Um, the thing is with multiplayer games is that it's becoming the bigger thing, obviously, with battle royale games and live, like games live service, and we all want that multiplayer experience so that we can be able to play with our friends. But a lot of times, those games can be inaccessible. We're starting to get better with it, but there are definitely some things that, that, uh, that can be done in order to be able to uh, allow this to be able to play. I mentioned earlier about just obviously being able to play and, and, and be a part of a community. I generally actually never go into random matchmaking anymore. I always have to be able to play with friends because at least I know that I can be with friends that understand my disability and can be able to move forward. Sometimes you see little glimmers of hope, and I'll even bring up our host Bungie uh, a little bit because I remember one, one moment in Destiny 2 when I first started playing it, I had my best friend basically guide me through it, 
And if anyone's played Destiny 2 in the Red War, there is one particular mission near the end where you're kind of in the city, and there's all the other, all the other uh, players, uh, like live players, are actually in this particular mission at a particular time. And we had two other players that were with us, and we were trying to get past, and I was trying to get past this jump puzzle um, that, uh, that I was having trouble with. Well, the players, two other players kind of like went off and did their own thing, and we just didn't think nothing of it. But then as I finally got past the jump puzzle, and we went a little bit further ahead, those two same players stood and waited for us, so, they, they, so for us to catch up, so we can continue forward together. There are moments like that, and, there, and that to a disabled player, doesn't, it feels amazing well, because it just it allows us to be able to think that, okay, yeah, we're not just being backpacked or being carried in experience. We all want to play the same experience. That's the thing that's like, I can't, like, I can't sort of jump into a team that I don't know because they'll just constantly be moving ahead and I don't feel like I'm contributing. So when it comes to multiplayer games, I used to be able to say that I usually let other people smarter than me to be able to decide on how to, how to be able to make multiplayer games more accessible. And now I'm unfortunately put myself in a position where I have to now think about that and I have to be the smart person in the room. It's tough and I, anyone has any ideas, I'm willing to be able to talk about it. Um, but what it really breaks down to is that disabled players want to be able to play with their friends and they want to play at the, at the same time. And also as well, a lot of accessibility People, and I, I guarantee this is probably a thought that you had in your head as I was speaking, is that some people think that accessibility is cheating. Stuff like auto-aim, auto-targeting, um, even, even just a couple years ago when Fortnite introduced the audio wheel, a lot of players thought that that was actually cheating. And I want to be able to encourage you, it's not cheating, because you're providing information that was already given to the player, you're just providing a secondary channel for them to be able to, uh, to uh, have that same experience. So a lot of accessibility can be added into multiplayer if you think of it from that perspective. Uh, and that's something that I would encourage you. Yes, there's definitely certain things like auto-aim, auto-targeting that have to kind of like be thought of and, and new different me mechanics that can work. Uh, and I have some ideas about that one. But I, I really, really would benefit, I think it would benefit players just in the long run. There's a lot of accessibility that can be added in right now that would benefit multi uh, players. Yeah, you might get some players that are gonna be mean about it and say, or whatever, and this is, it changes the entire meta of the game, or this feature's too OP. I get it, but in reality, again, it's just providing information that's already been given to a player. They just, didn't, they, they just don't cognitively think about it because it's just part of that experience. But for someone that's disabled, it can be the, it can be the difference of being able to not play a game to the difference between being able to play a game in general. So that's kind of it. Um, thank you very much for, for, uh, for, for allowing me to be able to speak here today. Again, I, I really love to be able to credit Game UX Summit um, because if, I, if it wasn't for the summit, I literally would not have the career that I have. Um, this literally was the beginning of my career uh, and I can't thank Celia enough for, uh, for allowing me to be able to talk literally five years later uh, from, uh, from that one moment and that moment uh, literally changed my life. Um, so if you have, uh, have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Um, but also, if you want to be able to contact me, I'm still, you know, I can still consult, uh, even though I work for Call of Duty. I'm not exclusive, so feel free to reach out. Um, or just ask me any questions about anything, or just, you know, jump in online whenever I'm on, uh, on Twitch or on YouTube, and uh, I would really appreciate it. So thank you so very much. Uh, amazing talk, Steve. I uh, just want to say, uh, first of all, it's, I'm so happy that that did that for you, but also you brought so much to the Game New York Summit. A, a few people here are here to hear you talk. Uh, so whatever <laughs> the summit brought to you, you brought it back. So thank you so much, Steve. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, <laughs> Okay, anonymous question is just hard to just bounce off of that. Um, okay, anonymous question. As a blind player, what are other sensory channels that help you navigate through the gameplay? Sound effect, haptics, et cetera. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I actually say pretty much anything that's not visual. Um, yeah, so audibly, uh, haptics, um, that really, really does help. Anything to be able to immerse me as a player into the experience and make it feel like that I'm in that world um, is great. Um, I actually, I mean, Last of Us is a great example of that, being able to use audio cues, being able to uh, have 3D audio to kind of help with that, also haptics as well. Um, and then obviously the, uh, the, the screen reader that's built in, narrator, that's something that I think 
is still desperately needed in, in, in video games for blind players. Um, it's it's something that we're like I, I, I really 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 would uh, love to be able to see it move faster on that, but I understand it's it's difficult to be able to add in that narration, but it's something that I think will be will be huge for, for blind players moving forward. So yeah, pretty much any any of those channels that really does help. Because what it really does is that for me, whenever I'm playing games, is I have to actively focus on a screen in order to be able to see something. And when I'm having to actively focus a lot, and there's not a lot of accessibility that helps me, my play sessions are generally, I can only play for about two to three hours before I have to stop and I can't even look at a screen for uh, because of just how, fatigued and how uh, my eyes just start to hurt uh, after a while. Anytime I can be able to sort of turn that active focusing into passive focusing because of either audio or haptic uh, accessibility, I can just lean back and I don't have to focus on the screen itself. Um, so a lot of, even though I do have some vision, there uh, even uh, uh, accessibility that will help totally sightless players can help me as well um, in a major way. And so that just only kind of makes it more comfortable. And I can be able to play games a little bit longer because that's, that's my hobby. And I love to be able to play more than like two hours a day, out of a day uh, to be able to play games. So yeah. Question from Joey Carpenter. What modern gameplay trends or features do you feel have immediately left accessibility behind? Who that left accessibility behind? That's a good question. Um, I think going back to the sort of the Souls-like uh, kind of genre, um, how that's become a lot more popular in that you have to keep dying over and over again in order to be able to, to, to move forward. Because um, there's a lot of times that it just, it's not even the difficulty that's the problem. Um, it's that there is not a lot of accessible design that's part of it. And again, it's sort of like the having to die over and over again to learn how to play. A lot of times for, disa for disabled players, it's just that we have no idea if our disability is getting in the way or not. And I would love to be able to see that trend uh, move back into, okay, let's make it more accessible. I know that's difficult because it is a different, uh, different market sort of making these kind of games that aren't necessarily the, um, uh, sort of open to a lot of accessibility consultation, but um, it's something that I get it, I get why people play it, I love it. I actually, I really do enjoy that genre. I just can't play it. And when I feel like I can't play it, it just hurts even more when it's so many of my friends are playing it and I can barely get past like the first level. And that's, that's kind of, uh, that's, 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 that's sad to see. And there's, and I know I'm not the only disabled player that, uh, that feels that way. But there are some disabled players that love that game as well. So it's not just, it's not a one size fits all sort of a, a, a bad experience. It can be good for other players, but. For, for a lot of players, it's definitely could, could use uh, definitely more accessibility for sure. Questions from Sweda. Uh, are there any mobile games that especially suck or don't, don't suck for you? Ooh. Um, I would, <laughs> um, there, I can't think of any examples at the moment, but there are definitely a lot of, uh, I think just because of the size of the screen, I generally don't play a lot of mobile games. Um, because a lot of the interface can be um, difficult to be able to read. And uh, I mean, I have to use my, my phone close to my face anyway in order to be able to see. And uh, if, if it doesn't sort of tap into something like, say, voiceover or just the built-in accessibility into um, the OS, uh, that can be really challenging. So sorry, I, I wish I had an example uh, at the moment, but um, uh, uh, I just, yeah, I just, unfortunately, I just don't play it as often as I, as I should. Question from Rebecca. What's your experience been like in VR? That's also a good question. Um, <laughs> so I played VR a couple years ago. There actually is a YouTube uh, video uh, on my channel where I tried VR for the first time. And I'll admit, I'm an emotional person. Um, and I did get emotional playing VR because it felt like it was the first time I was ever to play a game with my glasses off. And that was a big deal to me. And I, I think having that screen like extremely, like within centimeters away from my, my face, it was something that I felt like, okay, yeah, I could actually be able to see the potential of this. But the problem with VR currently right now is that none of the accessibility that's being brought into console or PC games can uh, be implemented until they can figure out how to be able to make it so that anyone can pick up and play it without getting motion sick. That's a much bigger important thing right now um, that needs to be solved before any other accessibility can, uh, can be uh, brought in. Not to say that it can't, it can't be done. Um, there's definitely a lot of uh, uh, studios I know that are trying to be able to add more accessibility into it. 
Um, I just think that like in order for it to be able to become a little bit more mainstream within disabled uh, players is that it has to sort of have that, um, that be fixed first. Is there any question, um, a verbal question? Yeah. In the meantime, I'm gonna ask another question. Um, does art style influence your experience as a blind gamer? Any style that are easier for blind, low vision players? Good question. I know I say that a lot, but you all have some great questions. <laughs> um, not particularly. I mean, there's an art style that I like aesthetically. Um, I, I, I like anything that looks cool. I'm all for it because um, I like you know. I mean, as much as me being blind as it is, I do enjoy a good art style. I mean, I think that I don't know if there's anyone here that worked on it, but like the Artful Escape was such an absolutely gorgeous game. Oh, if you haven't played it, totally play it. Um, I would even say as well, like in another great accessible game. Um, that had an interesting style. It was like the motion uh, comic book graphics, uh, as does Falls, uh, was a really cool, interesting art style. Um, Dead Cells was a great one. I, it's, it's not that any art style is more accessible than the other. There are ways to be able to integrate any art style in uh, more accessibility. Um, but it's, yeah, it just really comes down to kind of my own sort of like personal aesthetic. I'd say probably the ones that are difficult are the ones that have a lot more muted colors because it's hard to be able to separate enemies from the environment. Um, there are ways to be able to fix that, like stuff like high contrast mode or just making the enemies a little bit stand out against their environment. But um, those kind of games are like, anything that's sort of like, you could probably, it, it, like when I say the word muddy, like that, I think that kind of people sort of think of a few games in mind like that. I think that's kind of, that, that's kind of the, uh, the art style that's like, it's hard for me to play. Hi, Steve. Thank you. This was a great talk. Um, Thank you. My question was um, about the use of weapons, uh, which have like built-in tracking capabilities. So uh, Titanfall Smart Pistol comes to mind. Cyberpunk also has a couple of smart weapons, though I have not played that game myself. I'm curious how you think about weapons like that, because they kind of get blend the lore of the game into a built-in accessibility feature of the weapon. Um, Specifically with regards to risk and reward, because mm -hmm. what these weapons do is you typically take longer to aim, but you're guaranteed to kill if you can make sure your positioning is, is better than the other player. Yeah, the, uh, that Titanfall Spark Pistol is something that I'm very curious in uh, for, for many different reasons that I can't say which because of NDAs. Um, <laughs> but I will say, yes, there is one particular weapon and again, I, like uh, uh, you know, uh, Destiny Two is my favorite game of all time. If you ask me, I put in over five hundred hours in that. Game. Hey, yes. no, but plus you, you know, it'd be great. There's a weapon in that game that I love talking about. It's called Taiku's Divination. It's a combat bow, and the way it works is that if you, because there's two different modes to be able to fire any weapon in that game. You can have hip fire and, and through ADS. Hip fire in that in, with Taiku, it will target up to three target enemies. And it'll have like this little red diamond that lets you know that you've targeted them. And if you fire it, it'll automatically uh, hit those, uh, those enemies with the weapon. Thing is though, it only does a little bit of minimal damage. However, it tags them with basically concussive fire so that if you use ADS and hit them again, it causes even more damage. I am so good with that bow. I actually have a tracker on to be able to track how many enemies I've killed. I've killed over 10,000 enemies with that particular bow. And I'm not kidding. That's not hyperbole. That is literally, I looked at the number the other day. <laughs> so, and this is something actually I talked to, because uh, I did a talk at Bungie uh, literally the other day, and I, I mentioned this. So if anyone, Bun uh, anyone from Bungie, yeah, you can look up that recording uh, later. But I actually love the idea of designing more weapons with accessibility in mind. Because uh, that actually is a really cool way for, uh, for players to be able to kind of like, disabled players to kind of feel like, oh yeah, this weapon's mine. Like it feels like it was kind of built for me. And I feel like that even though I know that that weapon, the Taiku was not designed with accessibility in mind and it wasn't designed specifically for me, I kind of feel like it is. And, I've, and I, will, I will gladly talk about that. Um, also with Trinity Ghoul too, I love that bow as well. Um, but yes, I, 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 highly, I love weapons like that. I love to be able to see more weapons like that, um, especially when it comes to accessibility standpoint. Uh, and just, uh, the, only, the only drawback I would, I would say, I would caution, is don't make it so you have to go through a huge amount of hoops in order to be able to get it. I know that Taiku is an exotic weapon and it was difficult to kind of let you have, they have to go through a process to get it. However, um, I think it's like if you can be able to have it so that it's not so difficult, especially for those kind of weapons, uh, it could be really, it could, it could mean the difference. Uh, Cause I, I'll even say, I'm actually pretty good at Crucible with that Taiku. 
Um, so, yeah, if you play Destiny, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So there we go. All right, thank you so, so much, Steve. Please. Perfect, thank you. <laughs>